Ultra Kill is a fast paced retro shooter developed primarily by one guy, currently in early access. It's inspired by action games like Devil May Cry, but also tries to fuse that with classic shooters like Quake and Doom. And it's really good. I've introduced quite a few people to it, and everybody that's played it has really taken a liking to it. Gameplay is this game's biggest strength by far. The movement alone is really cool. There's a dash, a slide, there's a wall jump, and a ground pound. It gives you a lot of control over where you're going, and all the controls feel precise and very smooth. And there's even more advanced stuff you can do with the movement, but I'm not exactly a speedrunner. I can talk about the weapons, however. Currently, there's only four, technically five, weapons. It doesn't sound like a whole lot, but each weapon has at least two variations currently, and eventually, every weapon will have four. I mean, the coin gun alone is sick. It's a variation for the stutter revolver, which the blue default variant has an alt fire that pierces through enemies and blocks. Pretty cool, but not really worthy of heart failure. Then, you get the marksman variant. A lot of people I watched play this game would refuse to use the marksman variant because they had trouble hitting the coin. To be fair, it is definitely intimidating, but there's noticeable lenience for hitting the coin, and once you get used to it, it can actually become easier than shooting enemies normally. Look at that, I, I wasn't even trying to hit the coin. And you can punch the coin. You used to be able to punch the coin over and over and over again, and it would stack damage infinitely, resulting in... It caps out at 5 coins now, but the asylum that is the speedrunner community still finds ways of using it anyways. There's also the pump shotgun, which gets more powerful per pump until it gets too powerful and it explodes. This only does 50 damage, so it actually works as a useful tool to get rid of a bunch of enemies at once in exchange for a little health. And then there's your arm. Not only can you punch the coin, but you can also parry enemy projectiles with it, letting them know you're not happy with your product through high pressure explosion. And of course, you can punch enemies, but it kinda sucks. That is until you get the red arm, which not only demolishes these little British people, but also can be used to crush shotgun shells, creating a shockwave capable of killing several of them at once, and knocking back everybody else. I am admittedly a little worried about how the future variations are going to turn out, and whether or not they're going to live up to the depth that the already existing variations provide, but the recently released green layer consoled me a little. I'm probably going to wait till the rest of Act 2 drops before talking about it in detail, but just know that the fourth layer is great. You may have noticed that in the footage you're seeing in the back here, I've been magically regaining health during combat. The magic secret? Blood is fuel. Damage done close enough to an enemy will restore health. This is what really makes the game fun, because if you're not getting close, you're not getting health, and you're probably gonna die. Being aggressive is the most fun way to play the game, and also the most optimal. It is very similar in purpose to the glory kill system of modern Doom games, but I think it works a lot smoother here. Ultra Kill's campaign is not done yet, we're waiting on the remaining two acts of three, but right now we have the first act with the Windbow, Lust, and Gluttony layers, plus the Prewood layer at the beginning and the aforementioned Greed layer, a sneak peek of sorts at act two. Between all that, there's 19 levels in the campaign right now, plus the wave base endless cyber grind mode and literally GM construct. But the main attraction is still the campaign, and for a first playthrough of it, most people are going to find it pretty difficult, though the game does supply easier difficulties than the assist menu if you're having trouble. Still, on the whole, this game can be super hard, even at these easier difficulty levels, but the satisfaction of getting through it all overrules the pain gone through to get there. Once you're done, if you want more satisfaction, well, once you finish the first playthrough of the game, you've only just started. Much like the action games Ultra Kill is inspired by, each level gives you a ranking based off of time, kills, style, and deaths. Getting a good score in all of these categories takes a mastery of the levels and mechanics you probably won't have on your first playthrough, and so you'll most likely have to replay those levels to improve your ranks. That's what I'm talking about, baby! Most levels don't take too long to get a good ranking in, but it's the bosses that throw a wrench into it all. Every layer ends with a boss level, where the only enemy you have to fight is the boss. There are a few bosses you see at the end of normal levels, but these are more of mini bosses than anything, and fighting them doesn't really compare to the boss bosses. Tackling boss bosses is a little different than other levels. The first part of the level serves as a little obstacle course that you have to go through before being able to fight the boss. Repeating these sections can be kind of annoying, but with time you'll find secrets and get more comfortable to the point where you can breeze through it. And then there's the actual boss fight. These really push you to use everything you've got, and they serve as pretty significant roadblocks for most people. The final boss fight of Prelude, Cerberus for example, takes place in a really tight room, where if you don't know its attacks, you'll find it very difficult to avoid damage. 
By the way, if you're having trouble with the boss, or really any enemy, it might be helpful to look at the enemies panel in the store, as it now gives you tips to help fight them once you encounter them. There's also a unique tip of the day for every level, which can usually help with that specific level. But back to the Cerberus fight. This tight enclosure pushes you to either one of its attacks and dodge them, or to get up close with the shotgun to regain health. Then the other one gets up and... These sorts of oh shit moments happen all throughout the game, and unfortunately, discussing them in detail spoils the moment entirely, so I won't. But I just wanted to note that they are cool, and that they happen. Secret missions also fall under this category. Again, I don't want to spoil it, but the secret missions are cool. They're huge departures from the normal levels, and serve as a cool little side distraction. Right now, there's just three, one in the prelude, and two in Act 1. The final way of Act 1 doesn't have a secret mission, not because it has yet to be released, because it has something else. So far we've covered stuff that most people will interact with at least a little, the main campaign and maybe the secret missions. This is something that most people will never even want to do. In order to unlock this door, you have to get a perfect rank on every single level, which means an S in time, an S in kills, an S in style, and no deaths for all 15 levels. I did this months ago, before you could even open the door, but I still remember it being a pain in the ass, especially these guys. But now it's worth more than the accomplishment that you'll feel for doing it all, because behind the door is something really, really cool. And I really want to talk about it, but I'm starting to repeat myself. I don't want to spoil it for you. You can skip to the next section here. I would recommend it. But if you've already played it or you just don't care, welcome to P1. This looks like something wicked all over again, but it's not, thank god. This opening spinal staircase section still gives me trouble while pretty often replaying it since the challenge is just to memorize the spine's plumbing structure, which is pretty difficult to do when you can only see about 6 inches of it at a time. Not my favorite, but it's fine. Then there's Flesh Prison. Flesh Prison, at first, is super overwhelming. There's the eyes, and the constant beams of light, and the black hole, and the wave of projectiles, and don't forget that at any moment, the eyes can heal Flesh Prison back to full health. The pain of having all your progress on the health bar stripped away because you didn't shoot all the little goobers is immense. Despite all of this, the fight is actually pretty easy. All you have to do is circle around, shoot all the eyes out, and then try to do as much damage as possible, rinse, repeat, until it dies. And then the little orb pops out, and I was thinking, oh cool, I get a reward for all that. That is not a reward, that is Minos Prime. If you thought Flesh Prison was bad, holy shit. I said previously that the bosses in this game push you to use everything you've got, and this is an extreme of that. He attacks and moves so quickly that at first it seemed impossible to be able to react to any of his moves, let alone a fucking dropkick. Even if you parry it, you still take damage, so you have to parry it and then dash out of it for it to not do damage. It took me probably almost 200 attempts just to beat it, and who knows how many it took me to P-rank it. And the music, the music for this fight might just be my favorite in the whole game right now. And my punishment is death. It fits Minos as a character very well, and is a really good song in its own right. In fact, I bought this game soundtrack. I've never bought a game soundtrack before, and though I partly did it because I wanted to support the creators, I also did it because the music is really that good. Most of the music is loud and adrenaline pumping, which helps to fuel that rampage of collecting blood. The way it helps to establish tone throughout the game and set the scene is something I really appreciate as well. Like on 1-1, one -one, when you first get here, you've just been Cerberus, and most people spend ages fucking slamming their head into a brick wall trying to beat it, it being way more difficult than anything you'd face prior. So you're treated to this peaceful stroll in the park, and the music reflects that, relaxing and laid back. A nice little break. You don't encounter any enemies in the level until this one room, and then, your break is officially over. The music always fits the theme of the level and the aesthetic of the layer it's in, and the sound design is great. The powerful boom of the shotgun, the sounds of enemies blowing up into little gibbs, and even the cheers of the cyber grind all aid in the adrenaline pumping process just as much as the music. When you're trying to P-rank a level, you have to kill every enemy spawn, so tracking down loose ends can be troublesome, but not only does every enemy have idle sounds to signify their presence, Every song has a combat and non-combat version, so you can use that to know whether or not you've cleared a room of enemies. It's all these little details that's deliberately presented to you in both a visceral and practical way that I want to give high praise to.
Graphics are not something I actively look for, but it's always nice to have. Here, the textures don't look bad, but it's hard to be impressed by something meant to look outdated. I'm usually more impressed by the aesthetic trying to be established than its individual parts. The design of some of these enemies though is really cool. I love the street cleaners, they're just trying to grill. And the bosses especially have great designs. It helps that everything is very visually clear as well, and there's options to make enemies full silhouettes among other assist options. And you can change a ton of the colors on the HUD. There's also graphic settings that make the game look worse. I'm not sure why you would want to play the game like this, but the option is there for the elderly. I haven't mentioned anything about the story either, and that's because it's not really there. You get a little bit of cryptic background at the beginning, establishing how you're a bloodfield robot who, after, I assume, killing all of mankind, you've resorted to go to hell to get more blood. Characters are introduced by a boss fight since thanks to that blood is fuel thing, everyone has a pretty hard time making friends. And there aren't any cutscenes per se until you finish act 1, and even then it's really just a text dump. The story is interesting, but definitely not present enough to be a reason to buy the game or anything. The focus is very clearly on the gameplay. And honestly, I wouldn't want it any other way. Oh, and I can't forget about that whole early access thing. Most people probably don't mind games being in early access, but for those of you who are wary, you can try out the game's demo. It is a little out of date, but if you end up liking it, you're 100% going to enjoy what's in the full game. Nikita has also been very transparent about the development process, and for a handful of people, the team has been releasing new stuff pretty quickly. The game has a few problems, but they're mostly minor nitpicks, and I've only noticed them after playing the game for a long time. The price is going to go up as the game reaches closer and closer to a finish date, and with 100 hours and climbing, I'd say it's definitely worth it for $20 right now. And that's pretty much it. There were a lot more things I wanted to say about this game that I wasn't able to fit in this video, either because I wanted to avoid spoiling them or just because it'd be insanely boring to talk in detail about them. I could have been a little bit more critical, but this is pretty much my favorite game of all time right now, it's not done, and I just want more people to play it. When Act 2 comes out, I'll probably make a video on it, uh, full spoilers, and in the meantime, I really want to make more reviews, but definitely one shorter than this review. Holy shit, this took a while. Hopefully it came out okay, I know the audio quality is a little bit shoddy. Shoddy! Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> Hopefully it came out okay. I know the audio quality could use some work. I got a new mic through the middle of this and had to re-record everything. But uh, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.